Is it true that the Lopez and Osmeña families plotted assassination attempts on the Marcos family in the early 1970s? What can we learn from reading this book and others as well as the WikiLeaks documents online? I'll talk about this stuff as well as chapters 9 to 11 of the Conjugal Dictatorship for this video. Chapter 9 is called Too Late the Hero, and it's about the falsification of Marcus's war medals. A big part of Marcus's I guess, campaign in 1965 as well as in 69 was that he was trying to tell people that he was the most decorated soldier of the war. It was a big part of his propaganda machine to kind of bolster his image. Now the problem is, many people who were, impo were variously important during World War II in different events, none of them have really backed up any of the claims Marcus made. Because in his own book, so he has these biographies about his life, he claims that he was the, like, a main character in the war. He did, was like a huge um, figure during, uh, say, the fall of Bataan, for example, in various events in the history. And many of the people who were in those events have said multiple times, many different people, that they have never heard of Marcos being a part of these events. And a lot of the military medals he got, he actually got 20 years later. He didn't get it actually after the war. He got them, you know, in the lead up to the 1965 election cycle. And so in the 60, like 62, 63, he was accumulating these medals. Getting, he got it from very sketchy means. And the book goes into detail about, you know, those various medals. Uh, one of the interesting things I learned from chapter nine was that how the Marcus family would deflect blame about corruption was that we're not we didn't, we're not rich because we're corrupt. The reason why we're rich is because we got the Yamashita treasure. We found the Yamashita treasure, and that's how we got so rich. And Yamashita treasure is this. I don't know if it's a myth or something. I haven't really looked into it more deeply. But Yamashita was this famous Japanese general, and there was this kind of rumor of sorts that while he was going from Burma to Thailand to the Philippines, he was collecting lots of very expensive jewelry and treasure that he hid and buried here in the Philippines before he got captured. So according to Imelda and Ferdinand, whenever they're asked, like, how are you so rich? They say, well, it's because we found the treasure and that's how we got rich. So we got it legit. We got rich legitimately and not uh, because of, you know, corruption. But again, I don't want to go into too much of that. I don't really know much about Yamashita and the treasure. Uh, chapter 10 is called The Loves of Marcos. Now, this chapter focuses on his many affairs. It goes into very lurid detail about different women that Marcos slept with and what Imelda was doing at this time or how she developed her feelings, how her feelings developed about the Marcos situation over time with all this philandering. We talked a little bit about this earlier in another video about how his, her relatives would use the affairs of Marcos to, I guess, like threaten him in, in order to get them to get things that they wanted from Marcos and, you know, all this stuff. Uh, but I guess if I were to choose one of the many affairs, the most important one is probably Dovi Beams. For those who are unfamiliar with the Dovi Beam story, I'll kind of summarize it. There was this American actress named Dovi Beams who went to the Philippines in order to uh, act in this film called Maharlika, which was supposed to be about the war exploits of Marcos during World War II, which again, we learned have been or were like falsified anyway, but uh, he wanted to make this movie called Maharlika uh, because he was planning to use it as propaganda in the run up, run up to the 1969 presidential elections he wanted the re-election and he was you know not in necessarily the best standing at that point so he got this propaganda film made hired this kind of actress to play his love interest as a white american actress and during the period of the production of the film and so on even and after uh, they started having an affair where they would you know sleep together on i think it's even like northwestern street in green hills or something there was a house there where they would stay and meet up uh sooner or later more of the public found out about it it got into the press Melda found out she got absolutely pissed. And um, soon after that, Marcus started trying to distance himself from Dovi Beams. And Dovi Beams apparently fell in love with him and she felt very betrayed that he was suddenly going back on their relationship after he claimed to her that he would leave Imelda for her. And so she got very hurt by the local press, by Marcus himself. And so before she was able to finally leave the country, uh, she exposed Marcos by showing that had she was like a conference or a press conference or whatever and she released uh, these uh, recordings of uh, that she made while they were making love in the mansion in green hills and so these recordings uh you know really sparked lots of uh you know fervor throughout the country and even later on in 1970 during the first quarter storm in, at the university of the philippines the recording of marcus making love with 
um, Dovi beams would play 24 hours on the speakers of the university during the first quarter storm. And, you know, so, you know, if you go there around that time, you'd always be hearing the, the voice of Marcus. And he, like, he had these parts where, it, where he sings this, like, Ilocano song and all sorts of things that, that you know, I, I'm sure I, I've never listened to it, but uh, it doesn't sound like a, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I have no interest in listening to that. The film eventually doesn't get released because Imelda, because, you know, she got so pissed at Dovi Beams that she got the film banned. Um, and so the film never actually got released here. And... Uh, it's available online on YouTube because they eventually came out with a VHS copy of the film to be sold in I forgot what country in Europe, and um, I got I list, I watched it on YouTube. It's actually a very very bad movie, but if you're interested, you can look at it. It's interesting to see I guess what Filipino propaganda that looks like, because that was directed by Marcus meant for his '69 campaign, which again, as we learned in the previous videos, was the most corrupt presidential campaign in Philippine history. Okay, um, chapter eleven is called. Uh, the Philippine Gulag. The Gulag, a Gulag is a, a camp for prisoners in Soviet Russia. Why do you think um, Primitivo Mijares is comparing the Philippines to Soviet Russia, or comparing the jails here to the Gulag? This goes back to something I talked about at the very beginning of the book, which is that something I noticed is Primitivo Mijares' audience are Americans, or it's, it's directed at the American audience. The reason why it's directed at Americans is because I think the thrust of the book is to expose the Philippines and the many bad things going on in the Marcos administration as a way to convince the United States to stop supporting the dictatorship. They're saying like, look at all the bad things going on in the Philippines to Americans and say, how can you let this happen in one of your previous colonies? And how can you continue to support this country militarily and economically? So the book seems to be targeted again to Americans. And so the reason why Primitivo Mijares uses the term gulag is because during this time it was the Cold War where the, ba the main kind of enemies were the United States and the Soviet Union and so for Mijares to say look at the Philippines that you're kind of having a blind eye to they have their own gulag as well so how could you let that happen when you know you're supposed to have jurisdiction of sorts over the country or at least you know informal jurisdiction of the country um and this chapter is quite detailed and quite long, and it goes. It, it it describes and names many political prisoners during the Marcos administration, during the early days of martial law, and describes, I guess, from news reports, uh, and other sources. I'm not sure he doesn't really name them, but he talks about how these people got murdered, how they got tortured and killed. It's it's very detailed, and it was quite hard to get through, but. I'll read some of the names of the people that the book talks about because maybe it's you know important to say who they are. There was Nilo Tayag, Liliosa Hilao, Fortunato Bayotlang, Marsman Alvarez, Perla Samonod, Eddie Seneza. Uh, there were priests such as uh, Reverend Cesar Taguba, Reverend Paul Wilson, Reverend Jose Reyes Naku, and perhaps most popularly, um, Father Edicio de la Torre, who was one of the main priests revolutionary priest at the time he, he wrote many books about revolution as well and i guess he was very heavily influenced by liberation theology and i've been seeing his name come up in different books so he seems to have been a very important part of the anti marcus movement at least from the side of the priests but i don't think we learn much about him in general you can actually see him being interviewed quite extensively in the 1988 or 89 documentary a rustling of leaves which is you know about the npa um, government struggle in Mindanao during the that kind of time in the early Cory administration. Other people that the book talks about in detail are Nino Aquino, Jose Diocno, who is the father of the current um, um, Diocno senator who wants to be um, president as well. Or senator, I'm not sure if he's a senator right now, but he's, you know, in the news quite a bit. Nino Aquino was in solitary confinement for, confinement for 24 months. And again, a big part of the reason why it was important or very controversial that Ninoy was in jail was that many people expected Ninoy to be the person who would succeed Marcos in the 1973 election. So Ninoy was already on the rise and he was he was probably the person people would have voted for because Marcos, again, couldn't, ha couldn't have two terms. And the other really famous politician at the time, it seems, was Ninoy Aquino. So Ninoy was probably going to be the next president. And so, uh, you know, putting him in jail for years uh, was quite controversial for some people. Uh, one of the things that happened with Ninoy was that he could not contest the allegations made by certain people who were testifying against him. 
and so you know he was really just held there in detention for a very long time. Diokno was as well, where he had no charges even filed against him, uh, but he was put in uh, for in so in, in confinement for two years, and uh, he had very poor health as well. To really you know hurt his health. Now, the end of chapter 11 focuses on Eugenio Lopez Jr. and Sergio Osmeña III. They were two of the most popular political detainees of the period, and particularly because they were part of very strong political families that had lots of money as well and resources and were major factors in the Philippine, in Philippine culture and society before uh, martial law. Eugenio Lopez Jr., or Jenny Lopez, was part of... Uh, the Lopez clan, which I talked about in the previous video, which you can kind of look into as well. Uh, the Lopez's were, uh, the senior Lopez, Eugenio Lopez Sr., uh, originally funded the Marcus campaign in 1965. But later on, they had a falling out. And uh, so during the falling out, they ended up, you know, because they ended up releasing lots of like, because they own lots of radio stations, they own ABS-CBN, they own uh, Miralco and Manila Chronicle and many other news publications. When they started to kind of have more, I guess, expressing dissent about the Marcos administration, they felt like they were being betrayed by the Lopez's, and so they had like a whole full-out war. I go, I go into more detail in the video I made on the Lopez's versus Marcos, which you can look into. So the Lopez's were really like a political enemy of the Marcos's at this time. And the other one was the Osmania family. So why would, why would the Osmania family be a political enemy of the Marcos's? In 1969, in what is described as the most kind of corrupt election in Philippine history, where Marcos spent lots and lots of hundreds and hundreds of millions of pesos to get himself elected again. He was against Sergio Osmeña Jr., the son of previous president Sergio Osmeña. Uh, the third, the son, Sergio Osmeña III was his son. And uh, at the time, both fathers, Eugenio Lopez Sr., the, uh, you know, the father of, uh, the person who helped Marcos first, you know, the person who ended up becoming the enemy of Marcos, and Sergio Osmeña Jr., the father of the third, both of them were in the United States when martial law was declared. And right after it was declared, their children went to jail. It was a big deal because they had lots of political connections internationally. And so it became, uh, it became all over, it went all over international news where the detention the of these two um, were kind of a big political issue at the time. And so they, at some point they even staged a hunger strike where they tried to say like, you know, we're gonna go on a hunger strike until you let us out and let other prisoners out, like hundreds of other prisoners out. Uh, it, it got lots of international news until the, to the point that the Marcos, administra the Marcos administration ended up having to release many prisoners, but they never ended up releasing Lopez and Osmania. So why were these two people jailed? Marcos claimed later on that the reason why they're there is because there were six assassination attempts on the family, and the people who were in charge of the assassination attempts were their fathers, who were right now, again, were in the United States. So Marcos's claim was that Eugenio Lopez Sr. and Sergio Osmeña Jr. funded assassination attempts on the, on the Marcos's. According to the book, that's total false. It's, it's not true. And it was all, it's part of the, you know, and it's part of a tradition of Marcos lying about things and wanting to escalate feuds and wanting to subjugate his political enemies. That's just part of the whole thing, and that's why they were jailed. Other books I've read have different points of view. There's a book called In Our Image, which won the Pulitzer Prize for History in the United States, where it shows a U.S. perspective of things in the Philippines. That book claims that they, def that they, def they definitely planned assassination attempts. The book goes into detail of like the, the names of the hitmen that they got they hired and how they got into the Philippines and all sorts of stuff. It goes into you know quite a bit of detail and claims it really did happen. And the book frequently cites CIA and FBI and so, sorts of and all sorts of figures in Philippine history that you know make me wonder if that is the case. Maybe they really did uh, because the book is otherwise quite accurate um, in a, in for the most part. And then I looked at the WikiLeaks documents again. WikiLeaks is the Julian Assange leak government documents of the U.S. online. The WikiLeaks documents also says that they think that Marcos, that this Mar Marcos assassination attempts were also somewhat, you know, associated with, the, you know, they said that the WikiLeaks documents doesn't definitively say that they did it, but they say that they, they think it's likely that they were involved somewhat. And there are these people called Eduardo Fig Figueras, um, Larry Trackman, these people, Hearing Lemon, who um, testified and said so, and it seemed like the CIA also believed them. So, yeah, I don't know uh, if they actually did it, but 
documents say it, it's probably true.